And let's go ahead and pray for the nation of Israel. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, that, that Lord, Israel is the apple of your eye. That you have plans and you have purposes for them. So, Lord, we ask that you would just protect them, Lord. Lord, you give Benjamin Netanyahu, Lord, the wisdom he needs to know how to respond to this. Lord, we, we especially pray for those hostages, Lord, that have been taken captive. We just ask for your protection over them. Lord, we, we come against any spirit of fear. Lord, we ask that you just give them that, that supernatural peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we, pay, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. As we are instructed out of Psalms 122, Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Lord, we just pray in all of this, in the things we understand, the things we don't understand, we say, Lord, let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in Romans chapter 12 as we are working our way through Romans. And, and really when we get to Romans 12, we get to a place where there's a, a transition. Paul makes a, a major transition because all the way from 1, chapter 1 through 11, remember there were no chapter or verses. It's one letter. He, uh, he was basically giving from chapter 1 talking about you know, the fall of humanity, about uh, faith, by grace, were we saved. Then he goes on and we talked about um, how the different doctrines with Calvinism and Arminianism and the different viewpoints on that. And we talked about Israel and spiritual Israel out of chapter 9, but also physical Israel or ethnic Israel. And it all depends on what uh, the context is. And so you have all these, you know, different doctrines and, and truth that's being revealed. And then you come to chapter 12, and he makes a transition to, okay, in light of all of that information, what do you do with it? How now shall we live? So he begins to make practical applications to how we should live and how this all this information and all this doctrine and all this truth if it's just head knowledge you know doesn't do any good and needs to be put into practice and so he begins to go to chapter 12 and say okay how do you live now and in some of you I'm going to be reading actually from the ESV version today and I normally don't just because it's three times the size of my Little Bible. And it starts out differently, maybe, than some of yours, because uh, notice in NIV, it, the verse one, it starts out with, therefore, while in this one it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. But again, remember that key that anytime you see therefore, you always have to ask yourself, why therefore is there? Because what he's doing is he's going back and referring to everything we've talked about, everything I've written to you in this letter. Now, we're going we're gonna to come to this place, and what do we do with it? So, let's just read verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And he says, because of the mercies of God, and if you look back in the last of Romans 11, verse 32, it says, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Which means, we don't want what we deserve. We want mercy. Because we all deserve hell. But it's only by God's mercy. 
and he begins to use um, Old Testament terminology like you know about being living sacrifices, presenting your bodies. And of course, remember that in the Old Testament, it was all about the temple in Jerusalem. And now, in the New Testament, like in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says that, that you are God's temple. And in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, he says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So it becomes a whole realigning of our minds to begin to grasp that truth that now we are the temple of God. We are the temple that houses the Holy Spirit. And when it talks about living sacrifice, obviously in the Old Testament system, it was the blood of goats, sheep, calves. And when you sacrifice something, it died. But here we are called living sacrifices. So in other words, our lives are to be an example, a sacrifice of worship. And that sacrifice means giving up your will for his will. And that's a major issue because we naturally come and are born selfish. Ask any baby. Baby wants to, wants to eat and poop. And wants it now. And so we all have that ingrained within us, concern about ourselves as a top priority. But now he says living, being a living sacrifice means giving up your will for his will. Now let's look at the first part of uh, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world. You've heard it probably said, you know, that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So we live in this place. So we are to be like a, you know, like a ship in the ocean. But when the ocean gets in the ship, that's a problem, right? And unfortunately, as our duties as Christian is to evangelize the world, unfortunately, many times the world has evangelized the church. And the values that we're supposed to have have been diluted until things that are, are being accepted in churches should never have been accepted. And that's why you have to stand for the truth of God, even when it's uh, you receive persecution for it, even when you're called names. So we will always be swimming against the culture, the current of the culture. And another way we could say about the culture would be the spirit of the age. Okay. So we're always going a different direction. We're always having to swim up, upstream because the stream of culture is telling you to go this way and to receive everything the world has to offer. And if you remember back in Matthew chapter 7, you don't need to turn there, but verse 13, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way easy that leads to destruction. So it's very easy just to go along with the current culture. It's hard to go against it and the, because the way is narrow. And he goes on to say that many find the wide, but it's a small number who find the narrow gate. And in fact, if, if you look at that same passage in the Gospel of Luke, it's interesting because it starts and it says that Someone says to him, are only a few being saved? So this person is making an observation. He's seeing Jesus do miracles, heal the sick, raise the dead, multiply food, uh, teaching and preaching, and yet he's observing and he goes, but only are a few getting saved? 
And so it's always been about a remnant, a few. You can go through history. Noah, it was just Noah and his family. Now, that's a pretty small remnant, right? And then it was Abraham, and then it was the 12 sons of Jacob. And so it's always been a remnant. So even if we have, and we're praying for, a mighty harvest of souls of a billion coming into the kingdom of God, that's still a remnant compared to the mass of humanity. And so we have to realize this is not an easy walk. That's why Jesus said, pick up your cross and carry it daily. Because it's a lot easier just to go along with the world. Just to follow the culture, to get caught up in it. So let's look at the second half of that verse. So I'll go ahead and read the full thing. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal, renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Renewing of your mind, which basically means you change the way you think. And Colossians, I want to turn over there. Colossians 3 has some more ideas on this. Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to re read the first 15 verses. And it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. For Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him and glory. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. In other words, many of us walked in these things in the past. That was our lifestyle. But he said, then you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek, and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarians, the Scythians, the slaves, free, but Christ is all in all. By the way, the Scythians, the barbarians were afraid of the Scythians. They were bad. Verse 12, put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs 
with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So that's how we renew our minds. And I think about that part about singing praise and hymns and spiritual songs. Certainly is a lot easier now today since we have our phone, we have it right with us. I mean, you can tap in any time to worship and praise music. Otherwise, it would not be good for me to be singing by myself. You would not want to hear it. But we have so much more available in us and being in the Word. So it gives us a, quite a list of things that we need to do. Now, when it says in there, it says that by testing, what's he mean there? That you may discern what is the will of God. Now, that word testing in Greek is dok, dokomazo, which means finding out the worth of something by putting it to use or testing it into actual practice. So as we begin to grow in Christ, in certain ways, the way becomes more narrow because there are certain things that the Lord may let us get away with now that as we begin to grow mature that he begins to put his finger on and the way becomes even more narrow. But he's gracious for us and it's through his Holy Spirit is there to help us to walk in that way of becoming holy. All right, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than he ought to think, but you think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned him. So when we think of not thinking more highly of yourself, you know, that brings me to first think about pride. You know, pride is one of those things in, in Proverbs chapter 6 where it says it's one of the seven things that the Lord hates. It's pride. It goes on to say in that same passage, it says pride goes before destruction. And I remind you guys that sometimes success is harder to handle than failure. Because you can become a legend in your own mind. And so we've seen that through ministries across the United States. Very successful, but unfortunately pride comes in and then there's a great fall. And it usually just doesn't involve them, but it takes a lot of people with them. So pride is their major thing. Okay, let's look at verse 4 through 8. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, and the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So he points out that we're, you know, we're like a body. The church is like a body. We all have different gifts, different callings, and yet each one of those gifts are needed. So if we have a gift in the church that's not being exercised, then it hurts the church. 
we become handicapped because that gift is not in operation. And we also have that responsibility to develop our gifts. Even though that gift may start out small, as you begin to try to develop it, you begin to pray, you begin to practice it, cause it to grow and become more fruitful. Now, it's interesting that it says in chap this chapter of Romans, I'm going to look at those gifts again, because there's actually four different places where, in the New Testament where we have a list of gifts. So in this one it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy, teaching, exhortation, service, leading, giving, and mercy. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10, it says, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Prophecy. Now some of these be the same, and there's some addition. The ability to distinguish between spirits. Utterance of wisdom. Utterance of knowledge. The working of miracles. Gifts, and that's a plural, gifts of healing, various kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and faith. Now also in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, Paul says God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helping administrating various kinds of tongues. Again, each one is, is giving a different additional gift. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, what we usually refer to the, the, the five-fold gift, it says, and he gave the apostle, the prophets, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher. So we have all these different gifts and as it says, they're, they're different, okay? And, and we've talked about this before, but, you know, out of Ephesians chapter 4, you have those, those five-fold ministry, and yet you can see how that can be an issue because everyone looks through their lens. And if you have a, a strong gifting in a, a particular area, well, that's the most important thing to you. And... The other person has got a different gift, and he doesn't understand why you don't see what that his gift is the most important, you know. And so you have the, you know, like you you have the prophet who everything is prophetic. Nothing is, you know, nothing's by accident. In other words, that license plate. You see those numbers? That means something. God's speaking. Or that microwave clock. That's just not a clock. That's a portal into heaven. I mean, it's, it's speaking all day. So they have a lot going on in their minds. And sometimes that can irritate other people. The evangelist. The evangelist would be wondering why are we even in this room when their car is going right down 49 Highway on the way to hell, and you don't care, you're just sitting in here. That's his viewpoint. The pastor wants to gather everybody together, all come together, sing some songs, hug each other, pull a Lonnie, you know, just pull everybody in close. The teacher, you know, wants to teach. The teacher believes that if you just knew the word, you wouldn't have any issues at all. You just know the old word. If you, if you don't know the word, that's your problem. And the apostle, you know, as it says, apostle just thinks, you know, ten steps, way too many. One step, power Lord, it's done. So you have these different gifts, these different callings, these different emphases, and yet they all have to work together. And sometimes 
in a lot of churches, you have one person that's called the pastor. Well, there's no way the pastor has all those gifts. You know, and trying to fulfill all that is impossible. So the, the church is, is weakened because we don't have all those gifts functioning. And, and that's why it says that, that through love, we have to appreciate others more than we do ourselves. Because a lot of times, again, we see through our, our, our lens and we see what we think is important. And what we seek thinks important must be the most important. But that's not necessarily true. And that's why we have to lift others up and realize you have to have the whole body working together, each one fulfilling their part, each one part, their gifting in operation so the church can truly function in a way that is fruitful. Now here at Church on the Rock, we believe in body ministry. We believe that everybody in the body has a gift and everybody needs to be involved in ministry and that, it, that church is not just a spectator sport, but something we're all to be engaged in. And everyone needs to volunteer. Everyone needs to be serving somewhere. That's why we have cleaning teams. We have a worship team. We have uh, Josh and his team that works for the Bible's brunch and all these different areas that people serve in, the information table. We have lots of different places where people can volunteer, and that's the church becoming the church, the church functioning together. And one area is not more important than any other area. All right, so let's go to verse 9 and 10. Because remember, with all these different gifts, with all these different personalities, and, and again, the church is made up of living stones. So again, we're not bricks. We don't necessarily fit perfectly together. Some of those stones have sharp edges. Mine's real smooth. Some of you guys are pretty sharp, I'm sure. And we all think that too, right? It says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So think about that. So that that applies, especially as we talk about these different gifts, different callings, honoring one another, love one another, even with all the differences, realizing that we need the whole body to be one. And when it says, let love be genuine, it's not the love that the world talks about, right? So I'll just turn over to the love chapter real quick. First Corinthians chapter 13. And just to give the description. It says, love is patient. We all say, I want patient and I want it now. All right? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So that is the God type of love. It's a lot different than the world's description of love. All right, verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. 
be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. So when it says, do not be slothful, another uh, word we could use for that would be, do not be lazy, but be fervent in spirit. You know, we don't always feel that. We always don't feel fervent. We always don't feel, you know, ha have that desire necessarily, but that's where we have to recognize that, and we have to remember when we begin to feel that fire getting cold, we need to stir ourselves up. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. So, what do you do when you begin to feel that that you're beginning to get dull, or you know that you that you're losing that edge? That's when you need to turn to the Lord first. Sometimes it's in prayer and acknowledge it that you know I, I, I'm losing my fire. I don't have that same zeal I had. Asking the Lord, or, you know, repent. Turn to the Lord. Ask Him to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Turn on some worship music and just get alone with the Lord. Worship the Lord. Because we don't have to work at becoming dull. We naturally do that. So it takes an effort to make sure that we're staying sharp. That that edge is sharp. And as a, you know, the scripture says, iron sharpens iron. And sometimes we need that brother or sister to challenge us in that. Okay, verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Now, the rejoice and hope is when, you know, we have read the end of the book. We know how it ends. So we, regardless of what we're going through, we know the end of the story. And so whatever tribulation we may have, and Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We have a destiny with eternity. We win. And it says, be constant in prayer. You know, last night at their, our uh, home group, we were talking about that. Steve was even sharing about how he's recently felt more of a stirring to begin to pray. And I think probably in the church, it's probably the most neglected Discipline is, is praying. You can get people who will write books on prayer or do messages on prayer, but don't pray. You know, so it has to be put into action. And again, that's a place where sometimes we have to stir ourselves up. We have to evaluate ourselves and realizing, hey, we're falling short in this area. And in Ephesians. Let me look at a verse real quick. Ephesians 6, uh, 18, I believe it is. Yeah. It says, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To the end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. So, we are to pray constantly. You think, well, how do you do that? It's just that being God conscious that even in the midst of a busy day, you can take a few seconds to focus on the Lord. And especially when it says praying in the Spirit, because you can pray in the Spirit and your mind does not have to be engaged. So you can be driving down the road, you may be reading a book, and you can pray in tongues. So that makes it, whatever you're doing, you can be doing that. 
And so, again, I think that's a neglected area that we need to improve upon. In fact, if you have a prayer meeting, like we used to have on Wednesday nights, what's the most least attended meeting? It will be the prayer meeting. Always is. So we need to, again, stir ourselves up that that is one of the uh, spiritual disciplines that we need to grow in. Okay, verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So there is a priority throughout the New Testament. You know, we're, we're to, to do good to all, right? We're to bless others. But there's an obligation first to the household of faith. Or in this case, as it says, contribute to the needs of the saints. First of all, above others. And to show hospitality. Now, Jesse was talking about last week a little bit about hospitality and the kind of struggle with that and the growing in that, right? And contribute to the needs of the saint. As I was talking to Lyle this morning, by the way, Ashley is up in North Dakota with her brother and wants to bring him back, right? So they have bought an additional house and they're going to try to move him down, put him in that house, and help get it fixed up. So that's going out, showing your love in real physical ways. And I was really praying for her, by the way, just driving all the way to North Dakota, a couple of little ones with her, and uh, you know, that's awesome. And if you remember, her brother had been here. Is he still, can he walk at all yet? No. And he's had some, some issues, I know, and, and depression and that type of thing. So we really need to, to be praying for them, praying for her, especially as they travel back. So keep them in prayer. But that's an example of actually putting your feet to the ground, doing something practical, not just saying, oh, be blessed, but actually doing something to support someone. Okay, verse 14. We'll go verse 14 through uh, 17. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. You know, that first part, bless those who persecute you, is not always the easiest thing to do. Right? And yet we are commanded to bless those who persecute us. That person at work who's always grating on you, you know, always making fun, whatever it might be, bless those who persecute you. And rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. In other words, in our body we are to rejoice with those as they share good news, and, and you want to be with them in that. And also to weep with those who are weeping, those who are going through hard things, those who are in a, in a place of desperation. We need to be there with them, and, you know, really ingrained with them in that. Live in harmony with one another. Okay, all these different gifts, all these different opinions, all these different what we ought to do, live in harmony with one another. Again, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight 
of all. Now verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. If possible. Now that, what that comes in play is that you have to do your part. As far as it depends upon you, but you cannot change someone else's will. And in that case, there's going to be times when you will not be able to. But as far as it depends on us, on yourself, live peaceable with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will, will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that part about Keeping, heaping, burning coals on his head. There's a couple different, I guess you could say, thoughts on that. And I'm just going to read out of the ESV notes on it. It says, burning coals is a quote from Proverbs 25. Most interpreters think Paul is teaching that the Christian is to do good to people so that they will feel ashamed and repent, and that sense is possible. But in the Old Testament, burning coals always represented punishment. So another interpretation is that Paul is repeating the thought of Romans 12, 19. Christians are to do good to wrongdoers, recognizing that God will punish them on, their la on the last day, if they refuse to repent. Overcoming evil with good will ordinarily include acts of kindness towards evildoers. But it may sometimes be that the good of the civil government stopping evil through the use of superior force, police, or military, as Paul explained. So there's a couple of different thoughts on exactly what putting burning coals on someone actually means. Well, throughout this chapter, we see that, again, that he's referring back to all the first 11 chapters, all the truths, all the doctrine, all the things about Israel, all the, uh, you know, saved by grace, not by faith, not by works. And he comes to chapter 12, and he, and he begins to say again, okay, this is how you put into practice that truth. This is how you are to live. And many times that, you know, that's a challenge. And that's something that we, we grow in. We don't start there at the top. We stop at the bottom, start at the bottom, and we begin to work as we mature and as we grow, then we become more and more like Christ. It's like John the Baptist says, you know, I must decrease and he must increase. The presence of the Lord increasing within us. And over time, some of those areas that you struggled with will become no big deal. But then the Lord will put something, finger on something else in your life to begin to work on. And so we're being, we're being shaped and modeled into that image of Christ. And again, it takes time. and Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. But we keep getting up, we keep pressing in, we kept going through the goal, the upward call of Christ. And we do that 
by being in the Word, by prayer, by worship. And again, worship is not just when we're here on Sunday mornings worshiping the Lord. That should be taking place throughout the week. You have at your fingertips all you need to be able to enter in to worship. So take advantage of those things that you have because that's all part of the renewing of your mind. Because some of us had more years than others of being renewed on the dark side of things. So it takes longer to get up to where we want to be. And we never reach that place. I mean, Paul said, I, you know, I strive. I, I press on to the upper calling of the Lord. Not that I have made it, but I, I keep pressing on. We're never going to reach perfection in this body, but we are called to pursue that, to pursue the Lord in every area. And so it's just a, a good reminder. Remind yourself that God has called you and all the doctrinal things we've learned and all that, if it's not put into use, if it's not put into practice, if you're not walking it out, what good is that? You have a lot of head knowledge, but there's no fruit coming. And he called us to be fruitful. All right. So that's chapter 12. Next week, I'll be doing... Uh, chapter 13, and then I think the next week that will put Nathan at 14. And then the last week will be Jesse, and we never know what's sure going to be there, except I know why he always wants to be the last of the month, because his favorite verse is, the last shall be first. See? I, I, I know this stuff, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's go ahead and stand, and I'm going to pray. And if anyone needs prayer, uh, whether it's for healing or a job or whatever is on your heart or relationship, feel free to come up. We'll be glad to pray for you guys. Uh, so, Lord, we just thank you for your word, that your word is so deep, that, it, that Lord, your Logos word is, is powerful, Lord. And, Lord, we just ask that it would also become the rainbow word, though, that it would be alive within us. So, Lord, I ask today, Lord, that those who are, are struggling in any particular area, Lord, that you would this morning, through your Holy Spirit, that you would give them the help, that they would realize that the help they need is right next to them. They just need to lean upon the Holy Spirit. Lord, teach us your ways. Lord, as we sang earlier about, open our eyes, Lord, that we might see you. And Lord, we're calling out, we're crying out, Lord, for a greater manifestation of your presence. Because, Lord, we know that when you walk in the room, everything changes. And Lord, as we begin to see the, the shakings that are happening across the world, and we see, Lord, so many different things going on that show us, Lord, that the time is drawing near. Lord, you said, arise, shine. You said, stand erect, because you see the days are coming. And even though the days are getting more evil, that you're going to equip us with more of your presence, with more of your power with more of your gifts. So, Lord, we covet your presence. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do. Lord, in this lost and broken world, Lord, in this, in this culture that seems to be spinning farther and faster out of control, Lord, I ask that each one of us would stand as bright lights. Not having our, our light hidden under a basket, but Lord, it would shine brightly in bringing others 
to the kingdom of God. So Lord, we ask that you would do what only you can do. Only you can change the human heart. And Lord, as we talked about those gifts earlier, Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would distinguish their gifts, would develop their gifts. Lord, we ask for an increase of the gifts of the Spirit. We ask for an increase of your anointing, an increase of your authority, that when we minister to others, we minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask for that gift of the working of miracles. Lord, we ask for those gifts of healing, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, the gift of prophecy, tongues and interpretation, distinguishing of spirits. Lord, we want everything that you have for your people. Lord, that gift of administration, that gift of mercy, that, that uh, gift of giving, all those different gifts, Lord, we need them in operational. And Lord, that we would all appreciate the gift that our neighbor has. And Lord, there would be unity in the Spirit. Diversity, but within that diversity, unity. So Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.